A huge warm welcome today on Friday uh, for, for joining us for the Stories of Resilience, which was the project of writing relations. Um, and this is a series where we're really meeting people from different walks of life who will share their valuable experiences, wisdoms, and reflections on work that's needed to build a better path towards a heart-led radical social change is kind of the intent. Um, so my name is Renee Bourgeois, um, and I'm a member of the West Hub of the Writing Relations Network, which is a national network of radical adult educators and social <laughs> change folks. Um, and I'm coming to you today from MS Kuchiwatska Hygen, um, otherwise known as Beaver Hills House, or, or the colonized territories of Edmonton. Um, so this year, 2023, is the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, yet, we see that there are still so many struggles that continue to confront our local and our global communities. And while we have it, maybe international human rights law um, and foundations to guide us, we have such a long way to go to actualize rights and bring peace to our communities and to the world. Um, we see the rates of hate and intolerance growing, poverty is deepening. Canadians are only just beginning to reckon with our deep history of genocide and oppression. And so in our commitment to advance human rights globally, um, from December 1st to 10th, 2023, uh, the John Humphrey Center for Peace and Human Rights, which is a, a lead or partner in the writing relations, along with writing relations, will be hosting Ignite Change, which is a global convention that will host a series of human, of online, primarily online sessions to bring together civil society, academics, and decision makers in dialogue, learning, and action on human rights. Um, and these 10 days are really to profile and facilitate public discourse on the Universal Declaration on its 75th anniversary, as well as really strengthen collective action and commitment to advance human rights. Um, so there's a link in the chat from Angelica. Like, feel free to check it out. We're looking for people to engage, you know, offer up programming, support in, in building programming, and so much more. And we really welcome you uh, to be part of that. So as I mentioned, Writing Relations is a growing national network that strives to support and build capacity among adult educators and community organizers to provide space and resources to connect, reflect, and organize for heart-led social change and to build a just Canada. So if you're interested in uh, learning more, um, I'll just put, we'll put that website in the link as well. Um, sorry, I sometimes am prepared. <laughs> um, all right. So Today, I'm really excited to have Robert Philp here with us today. So uh, somebody who I got to know um, as the Chief Commissioner at the Alberta Human Rights Commission or, or was when I first started to know Robert, um, but he brings the extensive legal and judicial experience, including nine years as an Alberta criminal court judge, uh, seven years as a deputy judge of the Northwest Territories, um, in addition to his practice and judicial experience, Robert served as the Chief Commissioner um, of the Commission and Tribunals at the Alberta Human Rights Commission. Um, his practice today includes employment, labour, administrative law, and legal assistance to Indigenous communities. And he holds executive and board positions with many community organizations in Alberta, and continues to mentor young lawyers and law students. Um, and JHC staff. <laughs> so Robert lectures at many universities, is a frequent public speaker on issues of community poverty and human rights. He's been named the King's Council and re received the Queen's Jubilee Medal in 2003 and the Alberta Centennial Medal in 2005. And Bob was honored by the Law Society of Alberta and Canadian Bar Association with the Distinguished Service Medal. So J Robert, I wanna thank you for being with us today. and. You know, our whole intention of these series is to learn from folks like you who have this long experience of pushing on human rights and uh, really appreciate having you here with us. So, Robert, how did you how did you come to be a human rights defender? Well, uh, Renee, let me say, first of all, it's it's great to be here and it's great to uh, continue my connection with the John Humphrey Center, because uh, the John Humphrey Center is probably one of the. Uh, worst kept secrets in uh, in our city. Uh, a lot of people don't appreciate that uh, John Humphrey was an Edmonton lawyer, was uh, instrumental in uh, assisting with the drafting of the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, worked with um, Eleanor Roosevelt, who was the former first lady of the United States. And uh, I think the first uh, 
U.S. Uh, ambassador to the uh, United Nations when it was created. So uh, it's exciting history. And another part of the exciting history is that uh, uh, Jerry Gall, the late Jerry Gall, who was a law professor at the U of A Law School, was instrumental in uh, lifting the profile of John Humphrey and uh, and uh, and. Uh, you know, Jerry needs to be remembered always for that because it was very, very important. For me, uh, I think my interest got twigged when I was um, in law school and not many people probably know this ancient history, but uh, when a, a young man by the name of Peter Law, he became the premier of the province of Alberta in August of 1971. Uh, the first two pieces of legislation that his new government introduced in 1972, the first was the Alberta Bill of Rights, which uh, is a nice uh, framed document to hang on your wall, but it hasn't had much legal effect in this province. But the second piece of legislation, Bill 2, was uh, what was called the Individual Rights Protection Act, and it morphed into uh, the Human Rights Act. Uh, now, a couple of important things about that first piece of legislation is that it was one of the first pieces of legislation in Alberta, if not the first, to have a preamble. Uh, and preambles are important in the interpretation of documents or legislation because uh, they tell you a lot about, about uh, what the intent is, uh, what the legislative uh, will is. And interestingly enough, the uh, preamble to the Alberta human rights legislation almost mirrors word for word the UN Declaration of, uh, of Human Rights. And I think that, you know, when that government came to power, it was only 25 years after the end of the, of the Second World War, memories of, of the atrocities that occurred in, 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 in Europe were, they were mindful. Um, and uh, the the uh, and the other important thing about the human rights legislation was that it was said said to be paramount over over all provincial laws. And so um, I that sort of twigged my interest. Uh, and and you know this notion of uh, paramountcy that was. 10 years before the charter was written, right? And, uh, and uh, so they were really uh, 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 quite forward thinking. And I, I've described that period uh, in Alberta as, as, as the rights revolution, because not only did, did they uh, introduce this legislation, the Bill of Rights and the Human Rights legislation, but they also repealed the Communal Property Act, which was discriminatory against uh, our Hutterite neighbors. And they also repealed uh, a very atrocious piece of legislation, the, the Sexual Sterilization Act, uh, which uh, uh, disproportionately affected people with, uh, with uh, disabilities of not just uh, uh, mental or, or learning disabilities, but physical disabilities. And so um, that was to me, the first rights revolution. And when I, when I left law school, I started to practice in the area of labor and employment. And I kind of, kind of drifted into uh, human rights, but the real genesis for me was becoming uh, legal counsel to the Human Rights Commission. And in those days, uh, the Human Rights Commission functioned on a, a shoestring budget, much like it does today. 
uh, it's still a shoestring budget for the important work that they do. But uh, as legal counsel to the Human Rights Commission, uh, the way human rights complaints were dealt with back then is very different from the way they are dealt with now. And so the commission generally on the, on the direction of the commission would take carriage of the complaints uh, and the complaints would be heard by uh, ad hoc boards of inquiry that were appointed by the then minister of labor because uh, human rights was in the, in, in the labor portfolio back then. And so that's when I got to, to, to really sink my teeth into human rights work. And uh, I got to go to the Supreme Court of Canada on O'Malley and Simpson Sears, which is uh, a case about reasonable accommodation in employment. Um, uh, Mrs. O'Malley uh, was uh, employed at uh, Simpson Sears. Uh, a retail department store, uh, surprise, surprise, they were open uh, on Saturdays. Mrs. O O'Malley had a genuine conversion to uh, the Seventh-day Adventist faith, which uh, said that Saturday was her day of rest. And Simpson Sears wouldn't accommodate her request to have Saturdays off. And so eventually the Supreme Court of Canada uh, set the test for reasonable accommodation in employment. And basically, uh, you have to engage in reasonable accommodation as an employer, uh, unless it creates an undue hardship, um, affects employee morale, uh, maybe uh, bumps up against the collective agreement if it's in a unionized environment. Um, and and that, was, uh, that was an interesting case for me. And then then I got to participate in a, in a case in the Supreme Court of Canada called Binder and the CNR. And Mr. Binder uh, was a member of the Sikh faith. And uh, he maintained what are commonly referred to as the, the five Ks, which uh, so he was a Khalsa Sikh. And that means that uh, that. Uh, he wore a turban, uh, amongst other things. And, and um, so CNR, Mr. Binder worked in the CNR maintenance yards as a mechanic. And uh, they would roll in rail cars that need to be worked on over an open pit and the mechanics would be in this open pit. And CNR introduced a, a hard hat rule. Well, Mr. Bender wears a turban, can't wear a hard hat. Uh, and that case was about a bona fide occupational requirement. And it was the contest between occupational health and safety versus uh, human rights and Mr. Bender able to uh, follow the tenets of his faith. And the Supreme Court of Canada said, that's a bona fide occupational requirement to wear a hard hat occupational uh, safety legislation. Uh, in that case, and I don't like to use this word, but I will, uh, occupational health and safety legislation in that case trumped, see, I don't like to use that word, uh, <laughs> but uh, Trump, trumped uh, uh, Mr. Bender's uh, religious tenets. And then uh, I had some interesting cases before the Alberta Court of Appeal. One that I'm particularly proud of is a case called Prestige Cabs, and it was out of Calgary. And as a cab company, they had a rule. They didn't want to have turban wearing seat cab drivers. And so uh, uh, we took that on and uh, there was no 
bona fide occupational requirement there by Prestige Cab to 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 not have um, seat cab drivers. So uh, those cases, and I, <laughs> I remember another one. It's called Prue in the city of Edmonton, and uh, it involved. Um, uh, the Edmonton Police Service. And what happened there was uh, the collective agreement between the, the EPS and the city of Edmonton said, uh, can't hire police officers over um, 35 years of age. And I think Mr. Prue was uh, late 30s or maybe 40. Uh, and uh, we, we, we took that, uh, uh, case to the Court of Queen's Bench, and it was heard by uh, Mr. the late Mr. Justice Miller, who was a, a great justice. And interesting, the uh, police argued that, uh, well, the human rights legislation didn't apply because being a police officer wasn't employment. They were uh, appointed to an office, the office of peace officer or police officer. Uh, Justice Miller said, are you kidding? <laughs> and and he, he struck down the provision. Uh, and, you know, uh, historically, I, I, I mean, we've seen lots of instances of systemic discrimination where uh, you have a, what appears on the face of it to be a neutral rule, right? Like, I remember a time when they had a requirement to be on the police force, for example, that you had to be five foot eight or something minimum. Well, that, inc that excludes by its operation a lot of women, uh, potentially uh, a number of uh, Asian candidates, uh, and it has, no, it has no connection to the, to the job. So that kind of systemic discrimination, uh, I think uh, generally employers are more mindful of it. So, those are some of the early cases, and that's what got me uh, got me hooked. Because uh, when you when you when you do human rights, uh, uh, very quickly uh, can get into your bloodstream, and uh, yeah. but in a good way. In a good way, it's a, it's a positive kind of uh, uh, DNA. So. I hope yeah, that it's hard to turn <laughs> Sorry, it's hard to turn turn back once you start opening those those uh you know the blinders to what's going on in the Absol world it's hard to step Absolutely. it's it's impossible so you kind of hit on this next question uh robert but but i'll throw it at you anyway um but can you maybe share a, a memorable moment or a pivotal moment in your journey that really stands out to you <sighs> You know, there's so many of them, uh, Renee. Yeah. You know, and and generally speaking, uh, you know, um, human rights cases are so uh, personal to the people that are involved. Um, they they generally don't get um, a, a lot of publicity. Um, I would say. One of the cases that satisfied me the most was uh, uh, the Prestige cab case uh, with my with my Sikh uh, cab drivers. Uh, I, um, you know, uh, and having done human rights work, what it has caused me to do is to learn things about the Sikh faith, for example, right? A faith that uh, surprise, surprise, uh, was founded about 600 years ago as, as a pushback against the, the Hindu caste system in India. And it was a, and it is a religion that's based on equality between men and women. And, 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 and those kinds of things, learning those kinds of things, because I had to I had to learn those things to 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 be a be a better advocate for 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 uh, the complainants. So I would say that's um, that's one of the ones. I mean, 
obviously, uh, uh, you know, uh, human rights cases don't get much publicity. Uh, probably the most notable one is the, uh, the federal uh, child caring case that uh, Cindy Blackstock had, had a lot to do with him. But, you know, that's, that's a 10 year battle, you know? Uh, and um, and the thing about human rights is no one, no one likes to be accused of discrimination. No one. And so uh, people resist them uh, quite quite vigorously. And of course, the the legislation only, I shouldn't say only because they are important areas, but it applies to employment, which is about, 80% of the complaints that are generated are about employment. It's about accommodation and it's about services customarily available to the public. And that's, that's, that's a big one because who's one of the biggest service providers to the, to the public government and uh, governments don't like to be accused of discrimination, even though they may, they may engage in it. So, but I would say I would say that uh, that uh, prestige cab case will always stand out for me, uh, and it was uh, uh, I don't know, it just was 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 gratifying, and it was gratifying mm -hmm. uh, for my clients. An important shift, shifting point. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Case. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. You so, know, and I, I I would say this too that that you know. Our demographics have changed dramatically in the last 50 years since the human rights legislation. Uh, yeah. You know, um, I have a photograph somewhere. If you know where, if you know Edmonton at all, downtown in the uh, Gibson block is the Edmonton Women's Emergency Shelter. Well, that used to be a rooming house and it, there used to be a cafe in there. And there used to be an advertisement for that cafe on the back of the building. And it said, Gibson Cafe, good food, reasonable prices, open all night, so-and-so proprietor. And the last line said, white help only. And uh, it's painted over now that sign, but I but I have a picture of it somewhere. And I uh, so we we've come a long way. I mean, a hundred years ago, in 1913, the uh, Edmund Chamber of Commerce it was called the Board of Trade back then, uh, mm -hmm. convinced uh, Ottawa to pass the regulation under the Immigration Act to prevent black immigration to Alberta. Yep. You know, so, uh, yeah, we have lots yeah. of skeletons. In the yeah, lots of skeletons that like inform and manifest today that we often don't really realize as well. So, um, so Robert, if you were to think about, um, you know, what learnings you think the younger generations of human rights defenders kind of need to know and understand to be effective in their work? What would you, what would you, what would be your, your thoughts or learnings you'd share to them? And younger generations even includes folks like myself, like in terms of like how to be effective in our work. Well, just to, to put it on the record, Lenny, I'm part of that younger generation too. So, uh, uh, uh but I want, want you to know that one of the things that's disturbed me uh, in the last 10 years or so is this, this deluge of, of bad information that we get from, from American media, because it influences what happens here. Uh, um, you know, and and uh, you know those of us who believe in in, in human rights are are criticized because we're 
woke and uh, you know uh, and, and and what I would say for the younger generation is drill down, educate yourself uh, uh, you know the fake news is is, is uh, uh, all the stuff that that uh, that you know we're accused of, of somehow being bad because we believe in human rights i mean when when you see jurisdictions banning books like to kill a mockingbird or uh, or huckleberry finn or margaret atwood uh, you know um, and and you know somehow making making discrimination all right and that really really uh scares me so i think i think a we have to do more in in education uh, because young people i don't think they know enough about civil society about uh, about the import of democracy and the import of, of elections and the import of, 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 of human rights. Uh, because uh, if, if we don't expand that, uh, it's going to be problematic, you know, and it's interesting. I, I, I go to my granddaughter's school sometimes. She's in grade one. At, uh, at Victoria School for the Performing Arts, and 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 I look at the ethnic makeup of her classmates, right? And it's amazing. It's amazing. I mean, uh, children from all over the world and from all kinds of backgrounds. And I think uh, there's some promise in that, uh, but I think also. Uh, uh, Educators need to give some 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 guidance, you know. And I looked at that uh, uh, indigenous curriculum that uh, the government was rolling out, and uh, first of all, it was done by a consultant from uh, from from Maryland, so I'm sure they know a lot about Alberta. Uh, <laughs> And a lot of what they have is their content. Content is is cut and paste from Wikipedia. Uh, yeah. So we need to do more. We need to do more. And it's not just. Uh, I think we're all alive to uh, the indigenous issues. But we need to be alive, more alive to, to uh, lots of other things that are going on. Yeah. For sure. Thank you. We're getting lots of chat comments, so I'll, I'll bring those up in a second. I'll finish Ooh. our questions with you, yeah, Robert, and then we'll start to get into some of those. Uh, um, interesting. I'm sure we'll have a good conversation. I think uh, last couple ones I have, but one is like why. Why do you think it's important to even celebrate the 75th anniversary this year, uh, considering where we're at on things? Well, I think, first of all, when you when you think even back about the idea of creating a United Nations after the end of the Second World War, I mean, that was a that was a, a landmark decision. It, it's an organization that came about as a result of a lot of compromise. But getting the UN Declaration of Human Rights, I mean, it's, it's so important uh, given what we see going on in, in Europe right now, in the Ukraine, uh, a year after the invasion started. Um, when we see what's going on on the, the southern border of the United States, when we see what's going on on our own rocks and road in Quebec. Uh, we can't 
we can't let it fade away. And in fact, I would argue that that maybe we need to elevate the profile and maybe the events in uh, in December, 10 days of human rights, which is <laughs> really 10 days of human rights. That's great. Because uh, I think, I think uh, talking about human rights uh, uh, shining uh, uh, the lamp of scrutiny on 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 uh, discriminatory behavior, you know, uh, uh, the late Chief Justice Milvane, uh, when he was considering uh, the effect of the ombudsman's legislation, and so it's a very different context. But the ombudsman, uh, you know, attempts to bring fairness to, to actions of government. Uh, he said this. He said, "What's wrong with shining?" And I'm paraphrasing. What's wrong with shining the lamp of scrutiny? on uh, government actions, because as he said, looking at what, what is good can't be, can't be a bad thing. And shining that lamp of scrutiny in human rights, I think is, is, is critically important. And, uh, you know, and there's, there's pushes now to, uh, to make uh, uh, having a home, human right uh, uh, so there's there's lots to do but can't do it without without resources and we don't have enough resources and quite frankly uh, <coughs> the complaint process is important but the education process is more important more important and uh, it's fundamental yeah, yeah. absolutely can't claim our rights. We don't know our rights, right? <laughs> so that's no, a, no. That's and I hope, I hope the 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 ten days of human rights in December. Maybe, maybe we're going to engage with some school children and things like that. Because, and it's interesting, you know, when I when I listen to young school children uh, or interact with with some of my grandkids. And even my kids, when they were small, they'll say things to you like, that's not fair. Because they have an understanding of what's fair, right? And that's what, yeah. that's what human rights yeah. is really about. Yeah, very true. Okay. So let's, let's hit this next one, because I feel like you've, you're already, you're always kind of like ahead of where we're, we're going, which is beautiful, because it's naturally all <laughs> flows together. but. Um, and I, I think you kind of just hit this, but what do you feel really needs to happen to right relations and build a just Canada? There's a big one. <laughs> yeah, the uh, I just I mean, in law, the law is never recognized the tort or the wrongful act of discrimination. So uh, to get the protection, you have to have legislation, right? And uh, strikes me, and I know mostly about Alberta and a little bit about the, um, the Canadian scene, uh, the, the federal legislation, but it seems to me that there needs to be uh, a greater commitment to human rights, a greater commitment. And maybe if we had, for example, um, uh, not talking human rights away in some, some department, you know, uh, as, a, as an adjunct in the, in the, in the, in the uh, attorney general's office, but maybe have a, a standalone portfolio. Uh, you know, we used to have a standalone portfolio on the status of women. I think that's gone away too. It's blended in somewhere. And, uh, 
but I, I think you could, could find enough critical mass to justify a portfolio and to say, this is the minister responsible for human rights at the federal level, at the provincial level, and, uh, and, 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 and get much more vigorous because we're not vigorous. I mean, uh, and, and the co complaint process is, is important, but it's generally, in, in, in my view, not, not the most effective way to, uh, to, to deal with human rights. So that's one of the things that I would like to see mm -hmm. is the, uh, maybe, maybe that would, uh, would get it on the on the uh, on the national profile because what we're doing now uh, isn't working and politicians are generally content to say, well, you know, we we have legislation you can make a complaint, uh, uh, but that process is is ineffective. And I'm also concerned about the independence of uh, commissions because I don't think they're independent enough. Uh, so uh, the good news is that they won't ever repeal the human rights legislation <laughs> because it's baked, it's baked in now. <laughs> so, all right, Bob, I'll, I'll go to some of the questions in, in, in sure. chat and then Folks, if you if you do want to uh, ask a question, feel free to put your hand up. I can pause recording, but I'll, I'm going to keep it on as I'm saying the chat because I think some of these conversations would be good. So uh, there's the question: um, Human rights go beyond the employment situation. No, <clears throat> um, is is free speech a human right? And what about reverse discrimination, Bob? Like affirmative action, is it actionable discrimination to have quotas for certain identities? Whoa. That's a, a lot, lot there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Free speech uh, and then. Yeah. yeah. You know, there are, of course, limits to, to uh, uh, free speech, uh, the, the defamation laws and the, and, uh, and the hate speech provisions in the criminal code. Um, and, and and those are all important and and you know we've had cases like uh, uh, you know Ernst Zundel years ago a Holocaust denier uh, uh, and I think you know maybe we need those hate speech provisions in the in the in the in the criminal code so. Uh, I, I think generally we enjoy free speech. Uh, I know there's some issues in Ontario with uh, with certain university professors, uh, uh, or at least one university professor. Uh, but I I I think we I think generally we have a pretty good balance there. Um, uh, then then the question of, of what was the second part of that question, Renee? It's just sorry, I got to mute. It's kind of the piece about what about reverse discrimination, and affirmative action? Oh yeah, is affirmative it, action. Yeah. Uh, is it actionable discrimination to have quotas for certain identities? Yeah, I don't. You know, uh, we we uh, have provisions in the in, in the human rights legislation. We have. Uh, provisions in the Charter of Rights about the amelioration of, 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 of discrimination. Uh, I don't think, I don't think uh, in my reading of the law that we've seen much uh, pushback against uh, affirmative action. Uh, for example, uh, I suppose uh, if an employer, particularly a governmental employer, wanted to be able to target, uh, to hire more female firefighters, for example, uh, 
okay? Because that's a, and, and there were some cases out of BC about, about that, but they weren't affirmative action cases, they were discrimination cases. Um, because our, our society should be a reflection of all of us, not just some of us. And so uh, there may be cases where we're uh, having an affirmative action uh, uh, program uh, might have some merit, but I think it has to be looked at very, very closely. Uh, because when you, when you look at any kind of law, the first test is what's the mischief that we wanna overcome? And if the mischief is um, uh, a poor representation of a particular group of people, then, then maybe we do need some affirmative action. Um, you know, it, it's been a hot bottom, hot button item in the United States uh, ever since the, the Backey case, B-A-K-K-E, -E, and the, I think it was the University of California Law School. Um, and that was based on, uh, on uh, uh, race. Uh, and yeah, I think, there's, I think there is some room in some circumstances for affirmative action. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay, we've got, we've got one from Jim. I know you know oh, Jim. Uh, Jim. <laughs> Jim Garnett? Oh, yeah. I, I'm not. I'm not taking a question from him. He, he's a ringer in this, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> so he's asking, where in Alberta, the world, do you find inspiration in relation to human rights? Are there some examples that you can share of exciting developments that move towards a more just society? Hmm. What I, inspires you? <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I'm pleased about some of the, the cases that I uh, see coming out of the European, uh, uh, European Union courts, you know, because they have, uh, and, and they hear a lot of discrimination cases. And uh, uh, I'm encouraged by that. I'm encouraged by um, uh, what goes on in the International Court of Justice, even though it's a it's a it's a slow process, but the, uh, the genocide prosecutions uh, are 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 important. Um, uh, I think one of the uh, you know, I had occasion a number of years ago uh, to host um, uh, General Romeo Dallaire for a whole day in Calgary. And uh, uh, I learned a lot from him, particularly about his time in Rwanda as the commander of the United Nations. And uh, yeah. when, you, when, you, when you look at what happened in that country and, uh, and essentially because of the mandate he had, his hands were tied, uh, couldn't do anything. Um, I think, I think uh, I, I do believe that from a human rights point of view, we're better off today than we were 75 years ago or 50 years ago. Uh, but we have a lot to do. We still have a lot to do. Uh, it's it's not over. And uh, uh, but you won't tell him that I said this, but I take some inspiration from what uh, Jim does every day when he's in the inner city and uh, helping folks that otherwise wouldn't be helped. And so uh, I think generally we're uh, we're a compassionate society. I, I see that with response to the, the war in the Ukraine and, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, 
you know, people coming from, from difficult situations. So I'm generally optimistic, not pessimistic, but we, we still need to do more and we need the resources to do more. Yeah. yeah. The key thing. Okay. Well, uh, one more question and we can maybe open it to see if anybody else has any other ones, but uh, if you had one call to action to Canadians, uh, Robert, what would it be? <clears throat> I think uh, education, education, education. Uh, because, you know, just over a year ago, we saw the convoyers, not only in Ottawa, but in our own jurisdiction here and uh, at, at, at Windsor, my apologies. Um, and, and how, you know, how did that thinking get, get, get baked in? I don't know, I don't know. Uh, but surely if we have more dialogue and maybe we have to have more dialogue with people that don't agree with us because uh, it's easy to talk to people who agree with us uh, but it's much more difficult to talk to those who disagree with us and I think that uh, 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 getting to that level like i don't know if if i would particularly enjoy a conversation with donald trump but uh, uh, but but i think that's where we have to go and it's going to be education 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 and it's going to be education not only in the school system but in civil organizations 